All right. Hello, everybody. Hello again. Uh, for those of you who haven't met, I'm Brian Marr. I'm uh, on the advisory board for Seattle Interactive. Some people see me say this now three times. I'm getting tired of saying it myself. But um, So uh, they asked us to come up, and actually, a few days ago, they, uh, we, we looked at the, the list of all the presenters that were going to be here at SIC over the next uh, few days. And they asked us you know, who we would like to introduce. And as I ran down the list, I saw Hillel Cooperman's name pop up. Um, a number of years ago, I used to work at Microsoft. And I was in the Windows division. And a lot of the stuff that we did would come through from this person named Hillel that was telling us about design and user experience and um, really pushing the boundaries of what we were doing at the company. And uh, he left with uh, one of the other best user experience people at the company, Jenny Lamb, and started his own place called Jackson Fish Market. And uh, to this day, I've always been really interested in meeting Hillel in person. And uh, so this was a great opportunity to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, Hello, Cooperman. You could have just emailed, and we could have met. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of work to do. I'm flattered. Um, hey, could everyone in like the back 10, 15 rows bring it up here? Come on, let's go. Come on. I, I'm not kidding. I don't care. Bring it. Let's go. There's lots of room up here. Like, keep going. Yeah, no, keep going. You there, a like, couple more rows. Let's go. Listen, I know I'm that guy also. I like to go and sit in the way back and kind of not really pay attention and Come, you know, and surf and just be cool in the back, back row, back of the class. And it's a little better. All right. There, I, there's a couple of people who are like, I'm going to move up two rows, but that's all you get. <laughs> I have delicious cookies. Who here um, works at a... a so I'm guessing everyone here is either kind of a designer or a developer or agency marketing type person. Is that right? Did I miss anybody? OK. Startup, is that what you do? Sorry, I should have said, I should have said everyone here is either one of those or all of the above. <laughs> OK. So okay, who here is at a, a smaller company, startup or otherwise? Re, re, OK. And then, and then everyone else is at a big company, but probably working on some innovation or something cool there, or working in an agency maybe on someone else's product. Does that sum it up? OK. This is not really a talk about design. Um, I mean, it is and it isn't. Um, you know, aside from the socializing, and the lovely tote bags. <clears throat> Ostensibly, we come to these conferences to understand how people do things and to learn, right? And you have <laughs> thought that you could learn something from me, which is a whole separate debate. But, um, and that's not a crazy thought. If I see these delicious cookies, and I eat them, and they taste good, I may find the person who made them and say, What's, what's your recipe? Ouch. What's your recipe, right? Makes perfect sense. That's what we're doing here. See what you do. I like what you do. I want to know how you do it so I can do it myself. And this scales, right? Especially for things where you can follow a recipe, OK? Like all the way from cookies to space shuttles. This is, of course, and we, we don't use these anymore. We're in the post-space shuttle era. But uh, when the Russians decided they needed a space shuttle program, I guess they thought that the look of the thing was key to its function, because so they copied it down to every last detail. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't put an American flag on it. But <laughs> and, and we do this a, a lot, right? Like, especially when it comes to things technical and technology, like um, you know, we have our, our drug, and then we have our generic drug, which is just a copy. We deconstruct how it works, and we go make a copy of it, and it works the same. And so this is a great thing. And we even, you know, in technology, we have a whole notion of open source and sites that are dedicated to sharing your projects. Not only do you not have to copy, I will give you a copy of my success. I will give you what I've done, and you can copy it and go make it, you know, reproduce it. Exactly. Go nuts. You don't even have to do the work. But this 
doesn't always work with businesses. Um, and invariably, all of you, I mean, I suppose there are a couple of you who are working on a nonprofit here and there, but for the most part, and it's, for the most part, you are all trying to create a product or a service that scales exponentially, that resonates with an audience. Is that fair to say? Whether it's a startup or at a big company, whether it's uh, on a big product, a big established product at a big company and you're doing the next version, or whether it's a new product at an established company, or whether you're at an agency helping one of your clients, you are all trying to create something to create something successful, um, like those cookies. If it were only that easy. And by the way, the, the other reason the cookies are up there is because I just like to complain to the conference organizers that there were not any cookies. So, for example, and you see this all the time, we see businesses, we see a successful business, and then we see some people that are trying to copy it. And again, there's something about typography, I don't know what it is, that they think that if they, you know, if we just use the same font. <laughs> or maybe if we, you know, make it feel the same. This, you may all be too young, but back in the day, <laughs> the way you would get your movies is you would get in your car and go to this place. And, um, and then these guys, again, they, again typography, still, they, there's something, if we just have the same font. And then, and then it's so funny, because in a strange twist of events, then these guys took over from Blockbuster, and then they copied, um, they copied exactly what they were doing, and not in typography, but in the design of this envelope. I think anyone who knows a little bit about Netflix knows that the, this envelope is you know, intensely designed over multiple iterations to solve all kinds of problems and is a real uh, challenge. And of course, Blockbuster copied it. So how well did Blockbuster's Netflix like, sir? I mean, how many here are Blockbuster uh, DVD mail customers? You, sir. And I would imagine you are also, a, you are tweeting, but not on Twitter, but on Fraser. Or maybe you're firing up your Gisco app <laughs> on your BlackBerry. All right, um, the point is, <laughs> anyone here have a Gisco account? I don't know what Gisco, but again, like, you know, this, again, this thinking like we can just copy, right? Because it makes sense, because I can make the cookies. I can get your source code. I can make a space shuttle. I can, in all these situations, it is perfectly reasonable and rational for us to say, show me the recipe and I will repeat it but it doesn't always work, right? Um, you know, this and, and, and this and, and this and this are not these. And, and even this, right? Like, the, you know, this Burger Chef, this is a pretty, this is a big, big deal in the 50s, but ain't no Burger Chefs anymore. It's McDonald's. I don't know what accent that is. I, I'm trying to sound homey or something. I don't know what that is. Let's just let's pretend that didn't happen. The, and the, the real question is, why did some survive and others not? Why? Because if it were as simple as copying, I'd be you know, slapping Helvetica on a bunch of signs and brewing coffee and charging you 10 bucks a cup, and that would be it. I'd be on a boat, not talking to you. So in uh, World War II, uh, the Americans would send these big planes called bombers over Europe, loaded with bombs. And when you're loaded with bombs, you uh, are heavy and therefore slow. And you have to fly relatively low also to hit your target. And when you're, um, I don't know about you, but if I'm sitting somewhere and someone is flying a slow object near to the ground trying to kill me, I'm going to try to shoot it down. Because <laughs> you're trying to kill me. So uh, invariably, uh, that's what would happen. And in fact, they would liken uh, being a, a, a World War II bomber pilot or crew member to uh, uh, having a shift of a year where every day you run naked through a football field filled with bees. And maybe the first time you're not going to get stung, and maybe even the second or third, maybe even 10 times or even 20, eventually you're going to get stung. It's just going to happen. There is no way around it. There's nothing you can do. And so that's, they, they were losing basically 50% of, of their, their crews. And uh, this was you know, a bummer, <laughs> obviously, for the crews, um, but also for the Army, because they spent a lot of money training these people and, and 
you know, building these planes. They were like, we, we need to do better. So they brought the plane, the, the planes that would come back would be riddled with holes, and they would say, well, how do we reinforce these planes so that they don't get shot down anymore? And they couldn't put the reinforcement everywhere on the plane. So they would look at where the holes are and say, well, put the reinforcement there, right? Because that's where they're getting shot. This makes perfect sense, right? Except, of course, all they're looking at is the planes that survived. And those planes didn't need reinforcement where they got shot. What they need to look at is the planes that didn't survive. And in fact, you can't look at those because they exploded somewhere over Dusseldorf or something. I'm not trying to make light of uh, bombing, but like, they're gone. They can't look at this. And they, it took a, a mathematician to come and explain to them the hole in their logic. They were, they were like, these are the places not to reinforce the planes. Clearly, the planes can get shot there and do not need reinforcement there. You should reinforce all the other places where these didn't get shot. Now, this is called survivorship bias, right? You don't have... Um, you don't go and eat the crappy cookies and ask them how to make their cookies, right? You don't look at the crappy coffee chain and say, I'm gonna copy their recipe for success. You look at the winners. And this is problematic for a variety of reasons. And we're all complicit in this. For example, the media. So you see headlines like this. This makes me want to start a company, right? He's got a billion bucks and he's parting with Diddy, or his Again, I like to call him Puff Daddy. That's, I don't know about this whole change in name thing. I know it was many years ago, but I never, I never got that. Or they'll write, the media will write about, you know, these guys are so rich, they could be richer if they just weren't so idealistic. <laughs> and you read story after story like this and think, oh my God, I just have to start a company, I'll be successful. And when the media, can't write about actual success, and they never tell you the odds, by the way. They never write about all the failures. They, then they'll tell you about success like this, of money raising, as if that's success. Like, I know it's, a, like, it's, it's cool when you get a loan to buy a home, and you get a mortgage, but it's a fucking mortgage. <laughs> no, no one, you don't feel like, I succeeded. I owe the bank a lot of money. They owe 98% of my house. <laughs> um, they love it. They write about this as if it's, and when they don't have anything to write, if, if they can't write about actual success or fake success, then of course they just put up cat videos. The, um, I don't know if you guys remember this uh, business we cover. This kid did not make 60 million bucks. This is Kevin Rose from Dig. Anyone, anyone a Dig user today? With the Fraser guy, you, there it is. He's busy posting things on Dig while he watches DVDs from Blockbuster. Actually. VHS tapes from Blockbuster. Am I? That beta. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you on Fraser, sir. So, in fact, what this is is <laughs> he raised money at a valuation that if he could, that the valuation was 60 million bucks. So he got one person to loan him money, you know, or uh, investors to loan him money at that valuation, which in theory on paper makes his company worth $60 million, except for the fact that you have to have a whole bunch of people willing to also buy at that price. And now the investor who just gave you the money, well, they're not going to sell at that price because their whole point is to make money. So now he's got to be worth even more. Needless to say, Dig is worth effectively nothing today. Now, uh, 12 months later, whenever it was that Dig lost all its users, I want to show you the Business Week headline on, on, on that day. There wasn't one, because Business Week doesn't write about that. They write about this, because it's exciting, because we all want to read about By the way, these guys, they're not evil. They just wanted to sell copies of their magazine. I mean, is there even a Business Week magazine anymore? Do they print it? I don't know. The, yes? All right, cool. Um, how cute. Um, and uh, just being a jerk. Uh, and, and, and because we read this, that we click on these things, they don't, they write, like, this is the headline we want to click on. We don't want to click on, on, on this headline. <laughs> we like this one, not this one. <laughs> and it's not just the media that writes about success and, and hypes it. And it's not just us that faithfully click on those stories of success because they're inspiring. 
They're fun. It's like buying a lottery ticket. It seems nice. But founders and, and workers at failures don't want to, you never see a tweet like this. Just spent the last of our seed money on some ads. Didn't work. Looks like I failed again. No, nobody says that. No one does that. It's, it's a bummer. <laughs> and frankly, if I got, you know, a page full of that every day on Facebook, I'd probably just uns unsubscribe. Do not want. You're bumming me out. And it's easy to think that all there is is success. If you think back to the early 19th century, if we look at music and art, who are the, the musicians, the composers of the time? Right? Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, and the artists, Goya, David, and Delacroix. Like these, it makes you think, you get fond, you get this sort of a, a, attachment to days of yore. Those were the good old days. Look at all the talent. Except you don't know who the really shitty musicians were. Why is that? No, no one kept any of their recordings, or recordings, their uh, compositions. No one kept any of their paintings. They were crap. All we see is the stuff that survives. This is survivorship bias. And we are skewed by that, right? When you buy the Rolling Stones' greatest hits, the Harlem Shuffle is not included. Is that just too much? No one knows what that is. That's a terrible Rolling Stones song. That, see, what the joke is, I'm going to explain it now. <laughs> I was making a point. What's that? I can't. I've blocked it out of my mind. So, okay, so the reason that I got really upset about this is because I was at a conference a few months ago. I was invited very sweetly by these people at this design conference to give a talk. And the guy before me uh, was this guy, uh, I don't even remember his name. He's very fancy. Fa believe me, he'd be like the keynote speaker of this conference. He's a very fancy guy. He's been designing stuff for like 25, 30 years, and he's at some, he did some big agency, and they got bought by some big company. It's either like Deloitte or Anderson. I don't know what it is. I, I, it's some big fancy agency. You get my point. And he is all about, oh, they don't just design stuff. They will show you how to innovate. And he has done an analysis of all innovation. They've spent years on this, learning about innovation, and they've deconstructed successful innovators. And they have broken down a system where they can identify the seven key factors in innovation. And they, for the very low price of several million dollars, <laughs> teach you how to replicate that success. And as the guy was talking, he used all the standard examples. He had Apple and Facebook and how they conform. He's picking all the, all the winners. Look, they conform to my system. So by definition, if you just use this system, you know, it's, it, look, if you dress like a bird, I'm sure you'll be able to fly. And on there, and this was stunning to me, he had, as one of his examples, Zynga. Now, for those of you who don't know, Zynga is the company behind Farmville. And about two or three years ago, they were just out of control successful because they had taken advantage. They'd, they'd hit this perfect moment in time where Facebook had overindulged its developers to let them spam other users. And so Zynga just happened to hit the right moment in time before Facebook shut all that down and generated a huge number of users. And, and they just they got a lot of things right, but it was an, it was an anomaly. And Zynga is in the toilet now. And the laziness and disrespect of this asshole at this conference to include a Zynga slide as evidence of his seven keys to innovative success was so stunning to me because he so didn't give a shit about the people in front of him. He's so used to just doing it by road and taking his check for several million bucks that he was too lazy to remove the fucking Zynga slide when it no longer was relevant to his point. <laughs> and this is the... Zynga stock. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, listen, if you want to believe your own bullshit, fine, but have the courtesy to take out the offensive counterexamples before you show us your slide. And I, now listen, I'm a guest at this conference, and this one too, and I try not to be a jerk. And I'm not going to call the guy an asshole. Uh, and I understand he's selling something. I, I get it. 
And it's his thing. What do I know? I, maybe he's right. I don't know. I, it just didn't make sense to me, right? And so, but I can't help myself. So I raised my hand. No, but again, in a, I, I didn't go, hey, man. I said, you know, like a polite little, hey, just got a thought here. And I said, what about, I said, isn't, like, I mean, I'm surprised to see Zynga up there on your slides. And I said, but aren't, aren't they having trouble? Like, it feels like they're maybe not an example of your... And he says, oh, yeah, well, they stopped doing all the things we talk about, so that's, of course, why they're in the... I'm like, well, your tautology is complete. Um, why did... This one succeed and then fail, but then this one took over, and then it failed, and that took over. Like, I'm saying it in the wrong order, but like, I realized it was this succeeded, and then this succeeded, and that failed, and then this succeeded, and then that succeeded, and then that failed. Like, why? I, why is that? Well, I, because that's really the question. If you cannot, if we are biased by all the winners, right, we don't look at, at, at the losers to understand how to replicate success, then Especially when someone was a winner and then wasn't, we want to understand why. We want to know why, why, oh, that's, uh, that's the end of my talk. We'll be traveling to a magical fantasy land. <laughs> that's my nerdy desktop. I think it's cool. I want to fly on dragons. All right. Anyway, the point is, there was, I think I need to pick up my kids or they'll be okay for a while. Um, a little alert popped up. We want to know why is this? And even in the finding of why, we have biases, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is MySpace. It does not look like this anymore. You wouldn't know that because no one other than that gentleman use it anymore. <laughs> when MySpace failed, sorry, while MySpace was successful, I would say, I don't get it. That thing looks like a dog's ass. <laughs> no, it looks worse. I'd rather look at a dog's ass than this. And when it failed, I was like, aha! Because it's poorly designed. See? I knew it. I knew it was going to fail. It's just a matter of time. Look at the thing. How could this last and be successful? It's an abomination, right? It, it really is. It's offensive to look at and, and certainly to use. But the fact is, I don't really know why MySpace failed. And I'm sure there's a zillion articles I could find that say, oh, it's because of this, or because of this, or because Facebook, or whatever. I don't know. I don't know the answer. None of us really know. But I, when I tell the story, I say, oh, it's because it was, it's just a, a mess. Now, those of you who, who make software for a living, which is all of you, um, might be thinking, but Hilla, I can, maybe not on a, 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 a scale of MySpace and Facebook, I can actually test and see which things will succeed and which won't, right? We can do that. I can gather data and I can use that data to drive my design. We can do this, and that's true. We can do this. We can say, well, let's A-B test the price, $9.99 or $6.99. Let's A-B test the color of the button. Let's A-B test the location. Let's A-B test the headlines. Let's even A-B test the title of the book. That's how this book was named, right? Tim Ferriss went and put all these names through AdWords and tested the hell out of them until he found the one that got the most clicks. So some alternative uh, names for the uh, four-hour work week is um, uh, 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 The Upside Down Millionaire, Tastes Like Chicken, Smells Like a Rat. I don't know why that didn't do well. Um, <laughs> a Million Dollars for Your Life Youth. I'll give you a million dollars. I don't even know what. OK, whatever. Misspent Youth, The Soul Trader. What would you do with $375 million? And of course, my favorite, Bitch Goddess. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Grand Prix bullshit? <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, the point is, you, you, you can't... Oh, what? Okay. You, you, you can test things at this very detailed level, and that's fine. But when you are creating a new business, when you're creating a new product, when you're creating a new service, you can't test at that level. You just can't do it. You put it out there, and either it succeeds or it doesn't. You can't... If McDonald's wanted to A-B test, I mean, truly A-B test, like, the color... You know, and by the way, I would like to just take a moment to point out my kick-ass photoshopery. 
First of all, well, it's by the way, it's the Canadian McDonald's logo because apparently in Canada, all you have to do is put a maple leaf on things, and they're like, oh, okay, it's homegrown. <laughs> There's a maple leaf. So uh, apologies, Tamara from Canada. I got a lot of family from Canada. It's, we're good. Um, but there you can see, look, I left a little yellow. I think I actually did it in PowerPoint. So I just, I want, this is really an ad for our design services, <laughs> our visual design competence. But OK, but let's get back to the point. Even if you wanted to A-B test at McDonald's, you couldn't really do it. Because you'd have to have the exact same restaurant in the exact same location at the exact same time with the exact same customers in the exact same season. Like, you can't. There are too many variables. And we tend, because we are pattern seekers, right, as we create things, and we are trying to find the pattern of success and replicate it, we tend to over-optimize around the things we do notice. Right? Well, McDonald's logo is yellow, and they, this is their prices. Like, these are the things I can know, so those are the things I will replicate. But when you're creating a business or, or any creative endeavor, like a $200 million movie, you know, and they try to test these things, but ultimately the thing kind of is what it is. You spend $200 million, either the thing's going to succeed or fail. And we can have a debate about this one, whether it was success or failure. I have my opinions. And so the reality is, why did some of these, why did they succeed and why did they fail? Why? Like that is your entire job, right? Isn't your entire job to help things be more successful? All of you. Is anyone here not, that's not their job? At this point you may be thinking, what do I do then? <laughs> like am I even adding any value? Is it all just a crapshoot? Well, there are certainly experts, right? and experts who have produced books on how to succeed that um, will fill this room. There's zillions of them, and bigger than this room. They'll fill, in fact, an entire uh, uh, Barnes & Noble space that used to be occupied by a Barnes & Noble. They write magazine articles, and they put all this sort of sciency stuff. Doesn't it look sciency? It's like an infograph. There's the enabling process and product performance, and it's that guy again. Look, genetic, I mean, they, they have all these criteria, and they, sometimes they make spreadsheets, and they assign values to things, as if you can, or, or you'll go to some conference and have some asshole get up there and act like they're an expert on something. <laughs> oh. Um, now I'm lost. Um, it, it, and it, it does feel kind of random, right? Because, again, it, it's like, uh, if you've ever, if you have a little bit of savings and you go to a financial guy or gal, like financial services people to manage the money and you know, invest it for you, um, the first thing I do when I'm walking in that place is I'm like, can we just agree that you don't know what you're doing and I don't know what I'm doing? Because if you did, you wouldn't be here talking to me. And I've, I gave my money to the people who were like, yeah, we don't know. I was like, all right, now we're simpatico. That I get. Now, just because, um, and, and it's, it's terrible because it, it does feel random, and so then you wonder, should you just, just roll the dice or, or spin the wheel, as it were? And if there is no greater evidence of our desire to think that we can decode the mechanisms of success, it is roulette. Have you ever seen the big sign at the roulette table that shows you all the numbers that have happened in the last 20 spins? 9, 17, 26, whatever, double zero. Well, those have no predictive power over what's coming next. Zero. Even if it was all black 22, your odds of getting another black 22 are just as good as they were the last billion times. It's always the same. And yet, if you go to Amazon and search for roulette strategy, there are 312 results. By the way, one of the businesses I'm creating is Roulette Strategy Consultancy. Um, boutique Roulette Strategy Consultancy. I mean, what are these, some of these have multiple volumes. What are these people thinking? There is no strategy to roulette. There is none. I'm sorry. There isn't one. Other than lose your money and watch the wheel spin. Or other way around. And at this point, you might be thinking, I'm not above using, you know, cheap cat references in my, because um, what are you going to do, just give up? Like, you want to make something, you want to make something successful, and it's really hard, and basically my, what I've been saying to you is that you, no one knows. 
Like no one knows how to make it successful. And, and so one of my favorite quotes is uh, Oscar Wilde. He says, be yourself because everybody else is taken. And, and, um, and I, I love that because at the end of the day, you're just, you're, you're going you're gonna to fail a lot. <laughs> and then a lot more. <laughs> I, uh, I was at Microsoft for about um, uh, almost 10 years. And the, um, is it? Yeah, I go, all right. Okay. I'll, I'll buy that. Um, I was there for about 10 years, and people say, why did you leave? And in the end of the day, I say, um, I left so my failures could be my own. Because the only thing I learned at, at, well, I learned a lot at Microsoft, but the main thing I learned was not to let other, like, dum-dums fuck with my stuff. Because every time I, I would say, well, let's do X. And then by the time X actually made it out of the gate, you know, made it to market, if it even did, which was a long shot. It didn't look like X anymore. It was like some sort of Klingon hieroglyph. I don't know. It, it just, it didn't, and so what did I learn? I didn't learn that my idea was good or bad. Now, it turns out most of my ideas are crap anyway, because I've spent seven years working on my own stuff, and it turns out they're, but I, now I know, so that's a bonus. <laughs> and, and this failure, this failure is not just pain and suffering. This, this failure is opportunity. This failure is, is learning. Who here has kids? Right? And the kid's like about to, you know what's coming. You can see it a mile away. And they're just about to do something that is going to just scrape the crap out of their knees or they're going to bash their head. And it's almost impossible. Physically, it's like trying to stop a sneeze. Right? You cannot stop yourself from grabbing them and stopping them from doing that. Now, you can intellectually understand that scraped knees are good for the kid because someday you're not going to be there when they do this idiotic move. And now they'll learn, at least while you're there, not to do that because you're going to get hurt. Um, and there's a balance here, but this, this, you know, and this is a whole other talk about the degree to which we put our children in protective bubble wrap these days. But that's a separate matter, which I will not lecture you about today. The point is, these are good. Right? This, these, these failures are good. Okay, so I say, well, and, and by the way, the, the, the reason to be yourself is because you will tire much sooner of the failures if you're not. Right? At the, at every day I can say, well, at least I did something I'm proud of. No one else seems to like it. And this next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to be proud of. And it's something I get. And even if no one else, and hopefully at some point, maybe after the 350th try, I don't know how long it's going to take, I will make something that I am proud of and that it resonate with other people at some point. But in the meantime, I, I'd rather make something I'm proud of than make something I'm not proud of in the theory that I can somehow decode what I couldn't, you can't decode what people are going to want. You can't decode that success. So at the very least, make something you're proud of. And then you say, well, but Hillel, is it really just, you know, I'm doing your part when I say Hillel. I don't usually talk to myself that way, um, usually. So should I just cross my fingers? Uh, the answer is no. There, there are things you can do because it, it's not just luck, or rather, what I mean to say is it's not random. Success isn't random. It is a lot of luck. And mostly on a lot of variables that we just have no control over, especially timing, right? I don't know how to explain to you why Facebook succeeded where the others didn't, why YouTube succeeded where the others didn't. I do know, though, that if, even if I'd been at the same time and I'd created a YouTube clone, like pixel for pixel, and made a logo that was identical and maybe only slightly modified the name to something that reflected me better, like JewTube or whatever, you can laugh at that, it's okay. So, um, I, I, it wouldn't have been successful. And maybe there's other reasons for that. But my point is, um, I can't even imagine what videos would be on that site, that <laughs> success isn't random. You, you can increase your odds. Now, this is the point where it sounds like I'm giving you my seven keys to innovation. But they're really everybody. So I didn't invent this. I didn't do a study. It's, this is just common sense. Okay, So it's OK. And I, I'm not selling you a book either. The first thing is, if you're going to fail over and over again, do it a lot, right? If the path to success is the time when you screw up failure, you might, like, that, I mean, oh, well, that's good. Like, you really, <laughs> you, you've got to just do it a lot, right? And if you could do it simultaneously, even better, right? And yeah, it's okay to talk to people who have succeeded, if you must. 
But more importantly, talk to people who failed and find out what not to do. And often I find that even that doesn't help much because you believe in your idea so much, you're going to do it anyway. Right? Like, I do that a lot. People are like, oh, that didn't work for me. I'm like, you did it wrong. <laughs> Turns out, no, they didn't do it wrong. It's just a stupid idea. It doesn't work. But I had to learn. I had to learn for myself. And the beauty is, as you create things, especially if you're going to put it out to people, people, especially with their money, like they are, um, money is, is, is the, the, the single, you know, I'm a pretty uh, uh, progressive politically, but, um, but I think money is really good at a lot of things. And money is a really good indicator. It's a really good bullshit detector, okay? Everyone's going to tell you you made something great. But unless a bunch of strangers are willing to put down money for it, then you didn't make something that is, I'm not saying it couldn't be great otherwise, but not something that has chance to be successful as a business. You just didn't, because that is the metric. You may be proud of it, it may be lovely, it may be bettering humanity, it may be the best in its class, I may love it and love you for it. But until someone is ready to plink down money for it, then you haven't succeeded. And those are the people you have to listen to whispering in your ear, right? Those customers. Like, I will be a total uh, 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 self-involved, self-centered uh, uh, person in making my thing until the day I put it out there. And then it is humility time, and you will be humbled. Because they will say, this sucks, and, this, and you'll be lucky. You will beg for people to tell you your thing sucks. Because the odds are you will just hear crickets. No one will even notice the thing you made, because that's what happens 99% of the time. If you have people who are actually noticing, that's amazing. And, and really, they, they notice with, with their money. Now, I tell you to make a lot of these bets, and I recognize that's another dimension of money, that, that, that bets, and I guess we're back to roulette a little bit. Each of these bets requires resources, whether it's money or time or both, whatever it happens to be. And all that I can tell you is what we, what we do is we look at our resources and we scale the size of our bets to be as small as possible so we can make as many as possible. In fact, what I try to do is create a situation where we have an infinite source of funding for small, for small bets. I make lots of them to see what, what sticks. And I'm not just throwing random stuff at the wall to see what sticks. I'm making things that I'm proud of and that I understand. Right? I'm not, I don't know how to, how to I, I'm not the guy who sees, oh, they're going to be building a high rise there and one there, and this corner lot is decrepit now, but if I put a gas station there, then I'll be able to flip it in two years. I'm not that smart. I don't know how to do that. That speculating is very difficult for me. I know how to say, ooh, here's a need, and I think I have a picture in my head of something I can make for the, to fill that need, and I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it the way I would want it to be, and hopefully someone else will like it. That's it. That's the only thing I, I and, and to date, frankly, to be honest, it, it's a bunch of things that only I want, <laughs> effectively. Um, but, I, but I do know this. You will not get to that success if you don't keep going forward. This I know. It's like, you don't win the lottery if you don't buy lottery tickets. And guess what? You don't win the lottery even if you do buy lottery tickets. But at least you had fun trying. And it is the same with this. You have to take each of these steps and go forward. And I cannot tell you how far away the other side is. I cannot tell you how many it will take to be successful. And when our clients show up, so we have a, a sort of a user experience design shop, kind of a little boutique -y type shop, and people come to us, and they have business goals. And I never say, this is going to solve your business goals. Because that, that's just bullshit. I say, look, I have some experience. I can get you to the right place to start solving your business goals, and then we'll listen to what our customers tell us. I can see things that are in the way, but I, I can't guarantee success. And I realize that's a difficult thing, especially when you are a designer or an engineer or a marketer. It is fundamental to who you are to solve problems. That is what design is. That is what engineering is. It is you solve problems for a living. You solve them gracefully. You solve them with beauty and, and, and with intelligence and wit, and it's, it's lovely. But the, the big thing of achieving that success, none of us really know how to do it. And I'm just allergic, and that guy, thank, you know, 
I should thank him for the inspiration for the talk, but that guy just, he kind of killed me with that notion, that, that lie. It's just a fucking lie. That you can follow the formula and follow the recipe and you will achieve success. It's just not true. And I think the sooner we dispense with that, the sooner we will stop feeling like every failure is somehow bad. It's, it's okay. It's good. Like these failures are, are what moves us closer to success. And if one day I get hit by a bus, before I've gotten to the other side, before I've made it and made my successful thing, well, I won't know the difference, <laughs> right? I'll be dead. Is that a bummer to end on? Maybe a little? <laughs> no, but I think that's where the expression or die trying comes from, right? Like, I, I want to spend my life trying, right? And if the audience comes, that's a bonus. But at least I'm trying. That's it. Thank you. I don't know how this works. Is there questions or do I get off? Are there cookies? <laughs> Guys? Okay, does anyone have any questions? Did I answer everything? Did I bum you out? Are you dying to get out of here? None? One? Can I get one? All right. All right. Oh, there's one. I think they want you to go to the mic. I'm sorry. I know. It sucks. Spotlight on him. How do you know when to call it a failure? When to you quit? don't. You just don't. Um, I, we have this product that, that we've been working on for a while, and I love it, and I'm so proud of it, and it's my baby, and, uh, and it's a failure. And, um, I mean, it has, you know, thousands of, of lovely customers, but it's not profitable or anything, and, and it's, a, it's a beautiful product, and it makes me happy, and when I tell people about it, they go, oh, like it's that. And, and yet it's, it's and I... I can't bring myself to kill it because it it's my child, effectively. But, uh, and, and I will, like, basically, there used to be a lot more days and I'm like, I know, I'll do this. I'll do this. And then that would fail. And I'm like, oh, no, I'll do this. Now, there's a lot more days where I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> it's just not happening. But, but it is still, I would say, once a month, I'm like, oh, maybe if I, and, but then I got 29 days of, yeah, it's not going to happen. So at some point, the balance shifted, and I think it's about your own personal tolerance for banging your head against a wall and kind of how much money you have in your pocket. So, you know, I probably spent too much of the little bit of money on that. Um, but I had to know because I, I couldn't let it be a failure because I didn't try my hardest. And you know what? Even the continual trying, even after, maybe a little bit after I should have, was still profitable for me in what I learned. I was like, did that, did that, did that. And, and it's funny because now I'm, you know, we'll see. I mean, we'll see what the next thing, right? It all goes into the next thing, yeah, all the learning and the growth. So there's, I don't, I don't, that's the, really the answer. I should have just said the first two minutes, I don't know. And that would have been the whole talk. So whatever question you ask me, my answer will be, I don't know. Any questions? Yes. I'm not going there. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> um, so the, uh, uh, I think we all have those moments where we see something succeed and you're like, I thought of that. Where's my check? Um, the, the question was, you know, have any of this, the failures been about timing? I, I think that, you know, there's this notion of product fit that a lot of people write about. And uh, I think timing is an enormous part of that. I think timing is a, 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 I think luck and, and timing and all these things are such a big factor of, in all of our success that we don't acknowledge. And maybe that was the case for the stuff that I've made, but in, uh, I, su I think not, though. I think just people weren't into it, like is my sense for my stuff. Like I didn't go make like YouTube, you know, a year too early and call it YouTube, or I, I, didn't, I didn't do that. Um, I, I don't have anything, I don't know, maybe that'll still come. I'll see something big blow up and be like, oh my God, I had that, but two years too early. Or, you know, I guess being too late is easy. But, um, so, but I, I, I suspect a lot of the failure will be that. I don't know that I've experienced that as much. 
And, and the, by the way, the, the one success that I've had, and not success on this scale, is, is the consulting business, right? Like the consulting business, whatever superstitious act that does or doesn't do, I don't know what that means. What's that? Oh, that works? That worked for you? I'll do it. Okay, does anyone have any other little things I can do? Because um, I'll do it, whatever it takes. I'm totally superstitious. Um, the, the, uh, the, the one thing that has been successful has been an accident, really. And you read about this all the time. Well, we started doing this, and to do this, we had to do this other thing, and it turns out everyone really, really wants that thing. And so we sold that, you know, and, like, that took off. Um, there's time, like, that is the unifying story behind a lot of these successes. They always started with one thing, and then it turned out they really should be making something else. So I'm following that recipe to a T, because I keep making one thing, and, and I'm waiting for the other thing that will be the successful thing. Any others? Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, um, a, a lot of the, the one of our one of the products that we made is a product called the Story Before Bed, which is a product that lets you uh, record yourself reading a children's book, and the video is synced to the story. Um, and the uh, probably done 200 different things to market that product, 198 of which have failed, 197 somewhere around there. I don't know exactly. Ah, uh, failure. And the, the overcoming is literally just, we tried it, it didn't work, let's move on, right? The, the, the overcoming the failure is around my passion, around the product, and around learning, and around succeeding, right? Like, and knowing that the failure is making me stronger, I, I think. Or sometimes it makes me sob like a baby, but, but in the end, I'm stronger. And so the, the getting over the failure, the only way I really know how is to care about what you're doing. Because what choice is there? Well, what am I going to do? Just give up and go get a job? Like, I'm not doing that. I, I, don't, I don't know if you get the sense, but I don't do well with authority. <laughs> like, <laughs> having a boss is not for me. So I have no choice. I be, in fact, that, I do that a lot. That, actually, now that you ask, this is interesting. I create situations where if I don't try it again, I will be humiliated. Like, it will be humiliating for me. Not that anyone gives a shit, really. But I would be so embarrassed if I didn't try again. And so I will often put myself in uncomfortable situations to force myself to do it again and again and again and again. Or I'll go make a promise to someone that I care what they think. I'll say, yeah, this thing's coming. And then I, I have to do it. Because I don't want to let them down. I don't want to be that guy who says a lot of stuff but doesn't do a lot of stuff. I'd rather put it out there and it, it didn't work than at least than not put it out there. So does that help? Yeah. Okay. Any others? Okay, with that, thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it.